All right, I think we're going to begin uh, our webinar. Welcome everyone. My name is Jack Hanna. Uh, I am the former treasurer and state party chair for the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania. Uh, currently, I reside in Portland, Oregon and served as a delegate uh, for Joe Biden to the Democratic National Convention. I also am a member uh, of the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. And we are happy today that you have joined um, our presentation and welcome you. Uh, let me start off by setting the stage as to what our country faces at this very critical moment. We have underlying systemic problems that have been hidden for many years. Uh, one of the basic and most important of which are um, the lack of a development of our national infrastructure. Currently, uh, we face a pandemic crisis that's resulted in 30 million unemployed, over 10% of our populace. Uh, in addition, uh, we have yet to suffer the consequences of the lack of extra funding from Congress as far as state and local governments are concerned, and also additional unemployment aid. Uh, there are going to be additional layoffs as a result from the state and local governments not having those funds. In addition, there's a whole slew of bankruptcies that are in the offing that uh, uh, is going to create an even more severe circumstance than we face today. Healthcare, education, housing, political and social discontent are all problems and uh, systemic crises that we face and need to confront, especially the economic consequences. We today are going to be presenting to you a description of Two things. One, what happened in the 1930s under FDR's administration when we faced a similar economic crisis, the Great Depression, and what actions Congress and our president then took in order to address the challenges of uh, significant um, uh, unemployment and economic stagnation. Uh, the coalition for uh, a national infrastructure bank has already prompted action in order to address these issues. Uh, Congressman Danny Davis, Seth Moulton, uh, Bobby Rush uh, have all co-sponsored legislation that has been submitted into Congress, H.R. 6422, uh, that uh, prompts the creation of a national infrastructure bank. Uh, we are going to explain the details of how one worked before in the Roosevelt administration and what this bill would create as far as today for our economy. Uh, our legislation, uh, uh, in addition to being uh, uh, offered to Congress, uh, also was reflected in the Democratic National Convention's economic platform uh, where references were made concerning uh, now, uh, rebuilding our infrastructure, and we have a plan that is, um, fits perfectly with regard to that characterization. Uh, I am happy uh, today uh, to introduce you to our, our two panelists. Uh, before I do so, I just want to prompt you to please use the chat portion of our uh, webinar system in order to ask questions uh, that you may have that I will um, uh, then uh, relay to our panelists after their two presentations. Uh, please do not use the Q&A portion um, of the system if you would. Uh, for our first presenter, I'm very pleased and honored to uh, uh, announce uh, an Emmy Award winning film writer and producer uh, of Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? 
and author of the book, Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good. Uh, Stephen Fenberg, we are so happy to have you join us here today. And the floor is yours for your presentation of, of this part of the webinar. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Jack. I'm so very happy to be here today to talk about something very positive, encouraging, and hopeful. And the best way to talk about the proposed National Infrastructure Bank is to take a look back at its predecessor, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was the world's largest lender, the nation's biggest investor, and the New Deal's most popular agency. And ironically, it was started by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover. Now, to give you some perspective as to the scope of the RFC, it's important to realize the federal budget for 1932 was $4 billion. That's tiny compared to today when we measure our federal budget in the trillions of dollars. And if you want to uh, know what that's like in today's dollar, just multiply that 4 billion by about 20 and you'll see how much that is in today's dollars. But that's all to say the federal government in 1932 was tiny. And President Hubert Hoover was very reluctant to use the power of the government to address the devastation of the Great Depression. He was even once said that uh, to solve the Great Depression with legislation is like trying to pass a law to stop a hurricane. So he relied on saying the economy is good, confidence is high, the depression will disappear. But that did not work. And by 1932, unemployment was 25%. The value of stocks had declined by 75% and gross national product was sliced in half. People were eating grass to, to not starve and they were burning their furniture so they wouldn't freeze. Finally, in 1932, Herbert Hoover started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation thinking that making loans to banks, insurance companies, and railroads would build confidence and reverse the calamity of the Great Depression. That did not work. Uh, the RFC board was bipartisan at that time, and one of the uh, members was Jesse Jones. And he was uh, Houston's preeminent developer during the first half of the 20th century and a renowned banker. And he would observe about Hoover's RFC that he gave credit to Hoover for starting it, but he said it was a year too late and entirely too timid and slow. And if the RFC had invested five to seven billion dollars in 1931 and 32, the worst of the Great Depression would have been avoided. When President Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated, he supercharged the RFC. He didn't cancel it because it had been created by another administration and another political party. He saw the merits in it, as did Jesse Jones, who was a master at using credit. So within five days of Roosevelt's inauguration, Congress passed legislation that allowed the RFC to enter into the economy to make loans to, to businesses where when the banks would not do it. And the RFC took off. And here's what it did. Through lending, not spending, and that's the important distinction with this program. It was all about making judicious loans that were all eventually repaid. The RFC, once it had the power, used lending to help people refinance, remodel their homes to buy new ones. It helped business owners refinance their hotels, apartment buildings, office buildings, so they could survive the onslaught of the Great Depression. The RFC revitalized the railroads through uh, helping them renegotiate their bonds so that they could pay back their loans at lower interest rates at the prevailing interest rates, as a matter of fact. And it also financed the development of high-speed trains. 
all, many of these things that the RFC did laid down the infrastructure that would be required for mobilization in the 1940s. Only at that time, we didn't know that's why we were doing it. We were doing it to restore the economy, to save capitalism, and it worked. By 1936, these programs took, uh, had taken effect. Industrial output had doubled. Detroit was churning out more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929, and unemployment fell from 25% to 17%, still an unacceptable level. But these programs, despite what pundits might say today, were working. The RFC put its hands on every part of the economy. Its efforts were comprehensive. It couldn't just do one isolated thing and hope that it would restore the economy. It had to address all aspects of our national economy. Uh, for instance, for, the, for farmers, uh, surplus crops were depressing prices. Farmers were going bankrupt left and right. So the RFC created a corporation, the Credit Commodity Corporation. And with that instrument, it allowed farmers to store their crops. The RFC would make loans to farmers on those stored crops. It would take them off the market and allow prices to rise so that then the farmers could sell their products at a profit and save their land, save their homes, and save their farms. It was a tremendously successful effort. One of my favorites is the Electric Home Farm Administration. First, the RFC brought electricity to rural Americans. At that time, two out of 10 rural residents had electricity. 80% did not. So the RFC made loans to citizens, to excuse me, to cities, to utilities, to cooperatives, to bring electricity to everybody. So then they had all this power, but they had no money to go out and buy appliances. The RFC addressed that too. So a rural resident could go to the Main Street store and buy radio, a refrigerator, a fan, plug into the modern age. And the RFC would reimburse that Main Street store for the farmer's purchases. The utility company that was selling those appliances and the, excuse me, the utility company that was providing the power would then insert a small monthly charge into the farmer's bill with a little interest, and that was then forwarded to the RFC. By the time the program was liquidated, and that's an important point too, none of the RFC's programs were meant to exist in perpetuity. Once they outlived their useful life, they were canceled, and the monies were returned to the United States Treasury. That's what happened with the Electric Home Farm Administration. It was terminated in 1943 after it was no longer needed, but by then it had helped over a million families buy appliances, and according to Jesse Jones, it returned also a tidy profit to the taxpayers. And that would be my parents, my grandparents, your parents, your grandparents. Uh, the RFC was profitable, even during the calamity of the Great Depression, our worst economic downturn. It was helping people. It was revitalizing our economy and returning a profit to the United States taxpayers. The uh, RFC did, here's a great picture of infrastructure. It built bridges, tunnels, aqueducts, levees, such an important thing today as the Texas Gulf Coast and the Louisiana Gulf Coast is being smacked with hurricanes one after another. And we are sitting on dynamite because when a hurricane goes directly into Houston, into the port of Houston, we will have an environmental calamity, the likes which we have never seen. We continue to talk about building infrastructure dikes that will protect the Texas Gulf Coast and the Houston uh, Ship Channel, but it has yet to be done. And a new infrastructure bank is the perfect mechanism to address that need. Just like the RFC built tunnels, bridges, aqueducts when we needed them back then in the 1930s. Um, the uh, RFC 
also helped us prepare for World War. And I think that's just as important as what it did during the Great Depression. As war was spreading throughout Europe, we were completely unprepared, just like we were unprepared for the pandemic and climate change today. Our military ranked 17th in the world in terms of its size in 1939. The German military budget was 20 times larger than ours. We had 2,500 antiquated airplanes and about 350 obsolete tanks. The Germans had 9,000 airplanes. The Japanese had 7,500 airplanes. Roosevelt said, we need to build 50,000 airplanes a year. The trouble was because of neutrality acts and public opposition to intervention in the European war, uh, Roosevelt's hands were tied and he could not get Congress to act. So what did he do? He turned to Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporations, the nation's infrastructure bank at that time. And here's what the ROC did then. It minimized what it had done during the Great Depression. So as I said, Hoover's last year's budget was $4 billion. In 1939, the budget had increased to about $10 billion. And that's primarily because of the Great Depression and the need to uh, address the calamity. The, just to give you perspective, so we had a $10 billion budget in 1939. By 1942, 1943, the military budget alone was $100 billion. That's how expansive the economy had become primarily through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So two years before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation began building the enormous factories that would manufacture the tanks, trucks, airplanes, and ships that were required to fight and win World War II. We had none of that beforehand. We ended up manufacturing more airplanes in a year than Germany, Japan, and Great Britain combined. If it had not been for these efforts, uh, through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, there's no telling how the World War would have ended. And maybe the most miraculous thing it did that is so relevant today as we're trying, as we're struggling with the pandemic and how to address it is the development of synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production in less than two years. That began as well, two years before the attacks on Pearl Harbor when the Japanese overtook our supply of natural rubber in the Pacific Ocean. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation convened the heads of oil companies, chemical companies, scientists, and scholars. They got them all together to pool their patents so that they could figure out how do we create this vital substance. Once they figured it out, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation built the plants that manufactured synthetic rubber and just like all of its plants, leased them to corporations to operate. It was a massive undertaking, but just like it had done through the Great Depression and World War II, everything was comprehensive. It didn't just focus on one aspect. It built the airplanes, but before it built the airplanes, it had to manufacture steel, magnesium, aluminum, which we did not have. We needed rubber for the tires of the airplanes. We needed wool for the uniforms of millions of soldiers. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation, our vital infrastructure bank during the Great Depression and World War II accomplished these massive feats. And we can do that again today with our own infrastructure bank. But here's what it takes. It takes a belief in the power of good government to do these things. As Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it cannot be accomplished if we allow ourselves to believe that our government is our enemy. We must change our attitude about government. It's a good thing. It's patriotic to embrace our government and let it do the big things that only it is capable of doing. I think that that kind of wraps up my remarks to give an overview of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. I'm sure I left out a lot. And I hope that uh, our listeners will ask questions so that I can uh, 
you know, share whatever I can to, to help people understand the value of an infrastructure bank and what it can do. It can, it, just like the RFC, it saved capitalism, it saved democracy, and it can save our vulnerable nation today when we recreate a new national infrastructure bank that's just like the RFC. Jack, I'll Thank turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that great presentation. Uh, uh, I, and I'm sure everyone else, is so struck by the parallels uh, of the historic circumstances that our country faced in the 1930s and what we are confronting at this very moment. Uh, I take particular note uh, uh, with regard to the special tasks that the uh, National Infrastructure Bank helped uh, finance with regard to synthetic rubber and also um, draw a parallel to that to the 1960s with the Kennedy Space Program when the government makes a determination and effectively uh, implements it, great things can happen and great results occur. And that brings us to our next panelist who's now going to be talking about our current circumstances and situation as to how a national infrastructure bank would operate and function today. I'm very pleased uh, to present to you um, our next panelist and thereafter uh, we will then uh, proceed with responding to the questions that I already see that are posted and we will get to those after uh, uh, our, our next panelist. Uh, Alfeka Mutardi makes her presentation. Alfeka is a macro economist uh, and a bank expert for uh, the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. And uh, we are pleased to have her today uh, uh, to describe the legislation that has been presented to Congress, H.R. 6422, and the details as to how that will work. Alfeka, we're happy to have you here today and anxious to hear your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jack. I appreciate it. So what I would like to do is to carry on this discussion to tell you about how we can use a national infrastructure bank today to rebuild America's infrastructure and why that will be very, very important to our economy and to our workforce and to get us getting us out of this second great uh, recession that we're in. Uh, so what we did this go around, we've had uh, four national infrastructure banks in our nation's past. Uh, the very first one actually was Alexander Hamilton's first bank of the United States. Uh, and then the fourth iteration was, uh, as Stephen has just explained, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, all of these banks uh, are configured in a very similar manner and this fifth iteration would be uh, very similar as well. So why do we need a national infrastructure bank? Uh, why can't we do this through regular means to rebuild America's infrastructure? And the main reason is just simply because state and federal budgets have not been able to pay for the nation's infrastructure. The proof in the pudding is that uh, since, the, since the RFC was um, terminated, since its uh, mandate ended in 1957, our infrastructure spending has really declined in, in the United States. We've gone from something like 4% of GDP spending uh, in the 1960s down to about 2.3% today. And in, increasingly, uh, with regard to the federal budget, infrastructure has been squeezed out of the budget. Uh, the Highway Trust Fund has um, diminished and uh, effectively has um, gone into the red. And um, even reauthorizations for the normal infrastructure, uh, for example, HR2, uh, which is the Move Forward Act to uh, reauthorize over five years about 1.5 trillion in spending on infrastructure has gotten stuck in the Congress on account of concerns over the federal deficits. So uh, what we need is to have a national infrastructure bank to take over the responsibility for carrying the burden for infrastructure spending. So this iteration around what we did was to ask ourselves the question, how much do we really need to fix our, the, nation's, the nation's infrastructure? And uh, to do that, we went to the American Society of Civil Engineers, 
uh, who in their 2017 report card uh, said we need $4.6 trillion just to repair uh, roads, bridges, uh, waterworks. If you could bring up that um, slide, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and of the four points, that's the leftmost column there. Uh, that's the American Society of Civil Engineers saying we need 4.6 trillion uh, to fix all of these different categories here. Uh, and then of that 4.6 trillion, they, the engineers estimate maybe 2.5 trillion is already uh, funded. Uh, that would be through things like the federal government, state and local governments, uh, issuing municipal bonds, or uh, pu public private partnerships, for example, refurbishing an airport, those kind of things would be covered in that column. Uh, and then HR2, as I mentioned, is the, uh, would be part of that spending uh, right there. Uh, so it would be included in the 2.5. But the, the very rightmost column, the 2.1 trillion is definitely not covered. So the idea is the National Infrastructure Bank would cover whatever is not being covered through normal circumstances. Uh, and then in addition to that, we need other uh, spending that the engineers don't cover. We need high speed rail, uh, we need affordable housing, if you could go down to the bottom of the slide. Um, yes, uh, we need affordable housing. Uh, we need broadband access everywhere. Uh, we need some more work done on the electric grid that's not being covered by the engineers to uh, move renewable energy. And then we need some large water projects uh, um, to move water from where we have too much of it to where we don't have enough of it. And to really uh, have large water projects such as the uh, encatchment uh, dams for the Houston area that uh, Stephen mentioned before. So that brings us up to four, $4 trillion. Now, I would point out that the engineers' estimates are now four years old. And uh, they've been coming out with some new estimates, which are very much higher than this. For example, they came out with a new estimate for the electricity grid. Instead of uh, a financing gap of $177 billion, we really, it's closer, it's closer to, uh, 250 billion, and with with regard to water, the the uh, the unmet um, uh, financing is even larger, something on the order of 1.1 trillion over 10 years, uh, much larger than that figure right there. So these estimates might need to be uh, up uh, raised upwards as the engineers come out with some new estimates. So uh, that's that's the overall. Need. We've now, H, what HR uh, 6422 does is to propose the creation of a public bank that would lend uh, for to uh, the owners of, of uh, public infrastructure $4 trillion to do all of these repairs and build new enhancements. And all of this with the latest technologies, the latest state of the art technologies, and keeping uh, uh, using green materials and keeping. Um, the need for resiliency and uh, climate change considerations uh, in, uh, of the highest uh, consideration. So how would this bank work? Why, what, why is it that it uh, can uh, operate uh, sort of uh, parallel to the, to the federal and state budgets to provide this, uh, this financing? Well, actually it would work uh, just like a commercial lending bank works. Uh, so um, if you could bring up the flow chart, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, lend out, uh, as I said, eventually we're going to lend out uh, $4 trillion. Uh, in this flow chart here, I've got three little circles. The uh, leftmost circle is how we capitalize the bank. The center circle is how the bank gives out loans. And then the rightmost circle is how uh, the lending of the bank affects the entire economy and what it fixes. So we're uh, going back to the uh, left. We are going to capitalize the National Infrastructure Bank uh, using existing treasuries that are held by the private sector. There's about 17 trillion out there. We need about 500 billion in order to have a ratio of $1 in capital to, four, to, uh, uh, to $8 in lending. That's a very prudential ratio. Uh, and so what we're going to do is ask the public sector if they would be willing to invest their treasuries in the NIB in exchange for an equivalent of preferred stock uh, in, the, in the NIB that would pay 2% more. Uh, the reason for the 2% extra uh, as a dividend is so that uh, that would entice uh, um, investors to bring uh, their treasuries into the bank. 
that 2% on 500 billion would be would cost the bank about uh, an, uh, about uh, 10 billion in a year, which will initially take off of the federal budget uh, uh, as mandatory spending on account of the sales contract. Uh, but we're going to pay it back in a minute, as I'll just explain. Uh, so then uh, that would be the, the NIB is now holding the treasuries and earning the interest on the treasuries. And that would be combined with the, 10, the extra 2% to pay the dividend to the preferred stockholders. The reason for preferred stockholders is so that they would be silent partners in the bank. They wouldn't be investors, but silent partners uh, so that the bank could make precision uh, infrastructure project loans uh, according to explicit criteria to do the to build the best infrastructure and to uh, do the best job of supercharging the economy. So now the uh, uh, the economy is per the NIB is perfectly capitalized and we're ready to start making loans. What happens in the loan process? Uh, anybody that would come in for an infrastructure loan. Uh, would uh, sign a loan note, just like any standard loan, and they, uh, the bank, because it is a deposit money bank, uh, would put that loan up on its uh, asset side and would create a deposit uh, on its liability side of an equivalent amount. What that does is actually create the funds on the spot uh, to, pro to provide an exchange for the infrastructure loan. All commercial banks operate this way whenever you would go into a bank to make uh, a car loan, for example, uh, they would create the money on the spot. 90% of our uh, money supply in the United States is created by deposit money banks in this manner. Now, what kind of interest rates would the bank charge? Uh, it would charge the uh, treasury bond rate, which is the rock bottom uh, rate available, or 2%, well, uh, there's a 2% floor there. Uh, so since interest rates are very, uh, they're very low, even for municipal bonds, this would still be the lowest interest rate around. We want low interest rates uh, to lower the financing costs for these infrastructure projects. Uh, it would bring in to the bank, uh, uh, when it's fully lent at $4 trillion, it would bring in $80 billion in interest earnings a year. Now, what would the bank use its $80 billion a year for? Uh, it would uh, provide, uh, it would pay it, its workers and overhead, the same as any commercial bank, it would set aside loan loss provisions. Uh, it would um, maybe have enough left over for a little um, uh, subsidy uh, fund for uh, folks that uh, are having difficulty, uh, um, you know, um, being able to take on uh, loans of this size. And then it would have uh, at least 10 billion left over after that to pay back to the federal government a dividend to reimburse for the 10 billion that it took on the capitalization side. The reason for constructing the infrastructure bank this way is so that with respect to the federal budget, the National Infrastructure Bank would be budget neutral, would not require new taxes, and would not create any new debt. And given that uh, even this year alone, the federal government is going to be running a deficit of upwards of $4 trillion on account of the COVID shutdown and all of the expenses that the federal government is facing. Uh, it's having real difficulties uh, adding on any kind of uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, so this would take the, the burden off of the, bud off of the budget and would uh, be appealable to both uh, Republicans and Democrats um, for, uh, as, a way, as a means of financing all of the, completing the financing of all the nation's infrastructure uh, without, uh, without new uh, taxes and deficits. So uh, that, that's how the um, loans are given out. Now, who would the borrowers be? We think that they would be state and local governments. Why? Because they own 87% of the uh, nation's public infrastructure. Uh, by them coming to the table as the borrowers, they will be able to configure loans in such a way that uh, meets their needs. Uh, for example, a mayor of a city might come in and ask for a, a set of a bundled set of loans to fix all of the infrastructure at the same time, uh, both the roads and laying in the broadband and putting in new water pipes, uh, everything at once. Uh, and um, uh, spread the loan uh, burden across uh, several balance sheets, across utilities, the cities, the states, whoever owns the infrastructure. We could even create new entities along the way, just like the RFC did.
for example, a new housing authority or something like that to, to be the owner of the affordable housing. And that would, make, uh, that would make the infrastructure projects efficient and we would only have to dig up the road once. Now we would, bring, we would ask for the very best projects to be brought in first. Uh, we've done cost benefit analyses on uh, lots of different projects and then rank them all up as to what would be the, the, the best projects. Uh, what we see from a, a list of 40 of those such pro uh, projects, everything from um, new state of the art um, uh, air, air traffic control systems or traffic, uh, um, traffic signal control systems to uh, um, um, water projects in, uh, the, 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 along the Gulf Coast to high-speed rail projects from Atlanta up to Washington, D.C. All of those kinds of uh, projects uh, for every dollar that you would spend would plow back three to seven dollars back into the economy. We, we want to have enough uh, financing in our bank, for example, to cover all of the high-speed rail networks that have been uh, promoted by, uh, that have been designed to, uh, to be uh, laid out by the Federal Rail Administration across the United States. Uh, and uh, three to seven dollars back into the economy, these rail projects hire a lot of workers and they have some of the highest returns back into the economy. So we think that this four trillion in spending will do two things, it, uh, three things. It will hire at least 25 million new workers paying Davis-Bacon wages, full-time construction work to replace uh, the uh, jobs, the, the uh, jobs that, that folks currently have now that are not able to give them a living wage with full benefits, uh, like including health care benefits. And uh, um, uh, these will be providing, tr these jobs will be providing training along the way uh, in permanent construction jobs. Um, we'll have all hands on deck to do the training. Um, in addition to that, uh, um, we, th we think that we can rehire from among the, the people who permanently lose their job from COVID. We now have about 30 million folks that are on some kind of assistance uh, or another, either unemployment or um, f uh, food stamps or something. Uh, and so that they uh, would be uh, taking on these permanent jobs, paying uh, really good wages uh, and putting more money into the middle. Uh, the second thing is it would improve the productivity of the economy. This would be great for business. Uh, for example, trucks, trucks will move faster because a lot of these projects will be designed to solve the traffic congestion problems. We have some, uh, the single most, the greatest emitter of CO2 in the United States now has become traffic. Uh, even surpassing electricity generation and uh, putting CO2 into the air. All these, uh, a lot of these roads, we've tried to fix them with uh, putting toll roads on. It, it makes people having now to pay toll roads, pay tolls on roads, but the traffic problems still have not been uh, addressed. And we'll be putting more into mass transit and public transit and um, pa passenger rail uh, in order to get the cars off the roads, uh, uh, in order to fix the, a big, um, measure of the success of the investments by this bank will be the, the degree to which it solves the traffic uh, congestion problems. And then finally, uh, we think that all of this will supercharge the American economy. The last time around, during the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the term of that bank, uh, growth rates averaged five and a half percent per year. We think that we can get growth rates which have been really anemic lately and have been negative, of course, during the COVID uh, period, we think that we can get those long-term growth rates back up to the 5% level. When you have growth at 5% level, it means that you have uh, much more uh, money going into people's pockets in the middle to stimulate aggregate demand, which is great for businesses and um, uh, their, their, um, their bottom line. And then it's also great for state and local governments uh, and the federal government because more income taxes are rolling in and fewer people are needing to have um, uh, social services um, um, uh, 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 donations from the public, from the federal coffers, I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, we think that all of this will be really supercharge uh, American growth. And so the two, the, the two upticks, the two uh, takeaways from all of this is this National Infrastructure Bank has been done before. It can cover 
all of the infrastructure in every single state. There will be no need to be uh, uh, quibbling over who gets what money uh, from the state or federal coffers because everything will be covered. The bank is built that way from the get-go. It will hire 25 million workers with great paying jobs. It will supercharge economic growth. And it will solve the problem of state and local finances, because, which are really in the red right now, because it will take people off of the unemployment rolls and then more um, f uh, funds in terms of uh, income taxes uh, and improved revenues will be coming into the state and local co coffers, and that will uh, give them the ability to repay back the loans. So that's all of it in a nutshell. I went over a little bit quickly, but during the question and answer period, if anyone has any questions, we'd, we'd love to entertain them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfaka. Um, next, we're going to go to the uh, question and answer section. Uh, before we do, there's one comment that I would like to make. Uh, not only, uh, 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 not only uh, does our country faced a economic crisis domestically. But when you compare uh, the investment strategies that our country is making compared to the uh, European community and to China, we are behind. Uh, the percentage of our gross national product that's being employed to invest into our infrastructure in America is about 2.3%. In the European economic community, it's about 4.5%. In China, it is 8%. We are falling behind in the international race to have an economic system that operates efficiently uh, and effectively. And uh, if we don't make this investment today, uh, our country is going to fall further and further behind uh, others throughout the entire world. Now, next we're going to go to some of the questions. Uh, the first one uh, I'm going to answer. Um, uh, uh, Regina says she's interested to know uh, if the infrastructure bank bill has been coordinated with the Biden-Harris campaign. Let me say this. We have approached uh, the campaign uh, throughout the summer and continue to do so now. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of, the pre of our presentation, uh, uh, in approaching the Biden uh, uh, and Democratic Party's convention platform preparation, uh, a mention was made of the infrastructure bank uh, only obliquely initially. And after our efforts, uh, uh, references were expanded. Uh, and uh, I suggest to you that as a reflection of the Biden Harris campaign uh, responding to our suggestions. Uh, uh, at this very moment, we are approaching several members uh, of the transition team that are focusing on uh, economic policy to advocate for this position. And uh, we think uh, that is an important task and uh, uh, very much uh, appreciate the question. Uh, we think that that's the right strategy and we're employing it. Uh, next, we're going to have a, a question um, uh, that has been asked by uh, uh, Nimra from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, uh, but he asks, what was the advantage of making this a national economic program and not leaving it up to state and local governments? Uh, uh, Alfeca, uh, I'm going to toss that to you, uh, and then I don't know if Stephen, you would want to answer also. Um, uh, Alfeka, go ahead uh, briefly, if you will. Right. So, um, uh, as I uh, as I mentioned before, the, the the challenge of trying to finance infrastructure through state and local budgets has not gone well. Uh, that's why our aggregate spending has fallen from, from 4% down to 2.3%. It just hasn't been possible. We've tried to do it through the federal budget by giving grants, uh, which need appropriations, which need uh, either taxes or deficit spending to pay for it. And that's gotten squeezed out over time. Uh, the state and local governments, even though they recovered after 2008 and they tried to finance 
infrastructure with extra gas taxes at the state level uh, on a pay-as-you-go basis or by issuing municipal bonds. They have not been able to keep up, up with all of the needs. Uh, we've, tried, we've tried our hand with public-private partnerships uh, to finance this. It that's, works okay for some projects like uh, the airport refurbishment at JFK. Those things are suitable for that, but it just doesn't work for all infrastructure. So the proof in the pudding is we had not been able to do it by the normal means. Uh, the, the spending for infrastructure has fallen off and we really need a, a large national infrastructure bank like this new proposal, like the RFC in order to plow the road, in order to push for infrastructure projects that go across states, in order to provide technical assistance, in order to do uh, uh, urban development or rural development in ways that states and local localities have not been able to do. And we think that this, this infrastructure bank can really be the key to, to, to doing all that. Thank you, Alfak. Uh, sort of the economies of scale uh, uh, idea. Uh, Stephen. Uh, yes, uh, to, the, to the person who asked the question, I just have to say, hook them horns. I'm also a University of Texas graduate, uh, <laughs> but I concur with Alfeca that we have to have a unified, comprehensive response to our infrastructure needs now. And doing it state by state or local by local will not work. Uh, and that is, again, from evidence by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And if I could just take one second to elaborate on a point I failed to make. When I was talking about the Electric Home Farm Administration and how the RFC financed the purchases of appliances, that was to promote energy consumption. And I contend that a similar mechanism can be used today to promote energy conservation an EHFA can help people retrofit their homes so they're storm resistant and energy efficient. That will spur the green economy, create jobs, reduce fossil fuel consumption at power plants and reduce emissions. So I just needed to make that point. The reason why I brought up the EHFA was because we could use it again today in our new National Infrastructure Bank. I also want to give a shout out to the Republicans because we mentioned uh, President Kennedy and President Roosevelt. We also need to uh, uh, acknowledge President Dwight Eisenhower for building the uh, interstate highway system, a great, great infrastructure project that, you know, provides, you know, wonderful benefits to us all today. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. And, and let me just add on top of that, uh, uh, expanding our broadband system is also yes. an, a very integral uh, an important task of developing our economy, not only in our urban areas, but also in our rural ones. And uh, most, most definitely in our, in our remote rural areas, that's another way this EHFA could be applied to give internet access to everybody in our nation. So just like the people in the 1930s could plug into the modern age with radios, now we need our people to be able to plug into the modern age with internet access and broadband. And the National Infrastructure Bank can make that happen. And we always have to remember the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance, Finance Corporation did these massive projects and made money for the United States taxpayer. It did not cost us anything. Um, Stephen, another question here that I'm going to toss your way. Uh, can you give us an idea what was invested in public works and infrastructure as a percentage of the government's budgets any year from 1933 to 45 uh, as an example? Uh, I I don't think I can give you a percentage, but again, I go back to that $4 billion federal budget. The RFC throughout the Great Depression invested approximately $10 billion uh, in different programs, lending programs. They, these were loans to finance high-speed trains or to save the railroads or to help people retro to remodel their houses or refinance their houses or help farmers refinance their farms so they could save them. These were all lending projects. About $10 billion was allocated toward these projects, which multiplied many, many times over. 
all of that money was returned to the federal treasury plus a profit by the by 1939 before the rfc uh, shifted its focus from domestic economics to global defense so again four billion dollar federal budget in 1932 the rfc invested more than 10 billion dollars in the nation's infrastructure and in people's lives Thank you, Stephen. And uh, Alfeca, one quick question for you that I'm just going to ask. Um, uh, there's a multiplier effect, so to speak, with regard to the investment of infrastructure uh, money in as a, uh, compared to the economic impact going out. Could you just briefly toss some numbers as you understand them uh, with regard to that particular topic? Right. Uh, so the estimates for the top 40 infrastructure projects that I mentioned for every dollar you spend, uh, three, to five do three to seven dollars is plowed back into the economy. That's one multiplier. Another multiplier is the Kennedy Space Program, uh, which for every dollar you put in to that program, it, it returned back $14 to the economy. Uh, we also have some computer models done by the University of Maryland. Some other uh, universities have, have done input-output models where they do these cost-benefit analyses on, you know, a, a, a set uh, spending on infrastructure increasing over time. And what does that do to the labor? What does that do to job growth, uh, the economy, grow, uh, productivity, uh, GDP growth rates, uh, and all of those models show uh, that we can increase productivity quite a bit and we can get our GDP, the, the, the bottom uh, estimator is GDP growth. What does it, how, does, how much does it increase? And we can go from something like one and a half percent where we have been recently up to the 5% level. Great, thank you, Alfeca. Uh, Stephen, uh, you'll have the next question here from John who says uh, and asks in the 1930s, uh, the RFC addressed the failure of Wall Street and other banks, first in FDR's bank holiday, and then later in its lending activities. How do you see the National Infrastructure Bank in today's crisis in relationship to the banks? And do you believe we will face the same resistance from Wall Street that FDR faced in the 1930s? Well, that's a good, complex question. Uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the very first thing it did after Roosevelt became president, was to buy preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again. Hoover was making loans that just put them farther into debt. The RFC bought preferred stock to recapitalize them. All that stock was eventually bought back by the banks. The banks were never nationalized. That was never FDR's or Jones's intention. They wanted to preserve capitalism. Uh, but the RFC did need to step in as an infrastructure bank. That same program Jesse Jones called it the bank repair program, was duplicated in 2008 by TARP. The Troubled Asset Relief Program was precisely what Jesse Jones had done in 1933 with the nation's banks. And he said that without, that was fundamental, that without saving the nation's banks, the rest of the house would have collapsed. It was like putting a foundation under the economy to, to stabilize the banks and to help them lend again. When the bankers sat on the cash and wouldn't lend it, the federal government then had to step in and start making loans to municipalities, businesses, and individuals. It didn't want to do that. It always gave the banks the first shot at doing everything. If the bank was unable or unwilling to participate, the RFC was the lender of last resort. And I would assume that a national infrastructure bank, if it came to that, could fulfill that role again. Thank you, Stephen. And in this uh, day and age of, uh, uh, dare I say, astronomical Wall Street uh, stock prices and numbers, uh, uh, and uh, uh, pair that with the number of uh, what they call in today's economy zombie corporations, uh, when the, a bubble bursts, uh, it's going to be uh, um, uh, uh, aggravate the economic crisis we face today, uh, even more so. Um, another question that I wanted to toss back to Stephen was if he could please describe generally some of the 
um, rural development programs, uh, the uh, uh, FDR's administration helped uh, prompt and develop uh, in rural areas uh, such as electricity and the TVA and uh, how it might uh, assist in addition to the broadband issue that we just talked about a moment ago and also water uh, resources, uh, especially uh, here in the Western states uh, and the crisis that uh, more and more uh, of the populaces here uh, are having to confront. Uh, Stephen. Uh, I've kind of covered all that already with the Electric Home Farm Administration and the Rural Electrification Administration. These were monumental tasks that the government took on through the RFC to uh, bring electricity to farms. Two out of 10 people had electricity back then. They could not function. They were not part of the modern age. So probably the most significant thing the RFC did was to bring electricity to rural Americas and then help those people buy appliances so they could plug into the modern age. The other thing I mentioned, which is, is, is almost as important, if not more important, was uh, supporting the prices of commodities. Farmers were desperate. They, they couldn't get enough money to cover their costs for their corn, their wheat, their pigs. Uh, one person in the Roosevelt administration, uh, Henry Wallace, wanted to, in fact, they did. They plowed under a third of the crops and killed pigs to try to get the supply off the market. Jones thought that was crazy. He grew up on a farm. He said, no, let's store the crops. Let's get the crops off the market. Let's create scarcity that way. Let the prices go up and then the farmers can sell their products. Meanwhile, we'll make loans on those the, the produce so that farmers can live, so that they can buy food and put it on the table and keep their land. So I think the REA, the EHFA, the um, Credit Commodity Corporation, these are all alphabetic names, you know, for the New Deal. But the RFC was the original alphabetic agency of the New Deal, again, started by a Republican. Uh, another thing that the RFC did, not just for rural Americans, but for all Americans, was to help them refinance their homes and get better rates on their mortgages so they could keep their houses, so they could keep their farms. And again, it's important to remember, all of this worked and all of it was returned to the federal treasury with a little bit of interest and a little bit of profit. It was not their intention to make money. It just happened that way because everything was so beautifully operated and it was, it was run with transparency, which again is such an important point when we talk about our own new national infrastructure bank. Whenever Jones made a speech, he said, here's how much we have allocated. Here's how much we've had to give to spending programs rather than lending programs. He always made a distinction. Uh, and here's how much money we've made on it to return to the federal treasury, to the taxpayers, our parents and our grandparents. And now it's our turn. We could create a national infrastructure bank that can run as efficiently as the RFC because we have a model to look at and to see how it was done. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Alfeca, I'm going to let you take a, a, a shot at a, a similar question with regard to uh, uh, rural development, farm cooperatives, electricity, broadband, water uh, sources. Uh, your response, thank you. Right. So uh, we, I think in the order of things that broadband has to be one of the first things that the National Infrastructure Bank works on. Uh, because it's very important uh, in this COVID age that we uh, get all of rural America linked in uh, with broadband, uh, all of uh, inner city areas that are underserved linked in, uh, if for no other reason so that kids can do their homework at home uh, during the COVID period. Uh, but far reaching things way, way beyond that. Now, uh, as we were uh, constructing this, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We understand that the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture has a really wonderful rural assistance program that does everything from build schools to transit uh, facilities to uh, uh, whatever, it building banks, whatever it takes in a rural area to make it a uh, viable going concern. Uh, so there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. So what we thought we, the, the bank, uh, the, the National Infrastructure Bank could do is simply come up alongside that program and provide the funding, which USDA doesn't have in uh, adequate, uh, as an adequate supply of financing, uh, and then let the structure of the USDA 
work its work to uh, rebuild these rural areas uh, for whatever it is they need. And that would include, that would include uh, um, uh, indigenous uh, um, tribe, tribal areas. Uh, it would include uh, you know, areas that need, you can do this in a, in a um, holistic fashion, in an integrated fashion. Uh, if you're talking about a rural area that's an agricultural area that also needs more water for agriculture, then we could uh, hook up uh, new water um, provision plants and that kind of thing uh, to make it all work. Uh, thank you, Alfaka. And let me just add that HR 6422 includes provisions within the bill that specifically targets uh, uh, economically stressed uh, areas uh, throughout the country so that they receive uh, first and foremost the attention that they deserve, uh, which they have not received in the past. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty as uh, being the host today to ask one of the last questions which is uh, something that I'm quite familiar with and pivot to transportation. Uh, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania and uh, um, having that be the case often and perhaps regularly used the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And uh, that was a very unique uh, development as far as transportation is concerned that I'm going to uh, ask Stephen to uh, expand upon. Uh, could you add a little bit of your expertise with regard to history uh, concerning the development of the Pennsylvania Turnpike? Stephen. I can't address the, that specific Turnpike, but I can talk about bridges in general, like the San Francisco Bay Bridge, the bridge over Niagara Falls, an aqueduct that was 244 miles that brought water uh, to the west. Um, I, speaking of water, you had asked about that earlier, and, and that's a vital issue today is so many municipalities, their, their water is not fit to drink. And that was something the RFC addressed through cooperatives, through lending to utilities. They helped build that infrastructure so people could have safe water to drink and we could do that again today. As far as transportation, you know, the, the Turnpike is a, is a glorious uh, road, but they, they addressed all kinds of different transportation, the rails. They saved the railroads and expanded the railroads. They financed high-speed trains, just like uh, Alfeca had mentioned uh, doing now. Jesse Jones and the RFC did that in the 1930s by uh, financing the development of high-speed trains. And I want to go to World War II again because the investment there was massive. You talk about transportation. The RFC invested in aviation alone 10 times more than that industry had invested in itself throughout its history. And the consequences of that investment are enormous today and then. We needed to do that so we could fight and win World War II. But it left such a massive new um, industry that was all converted back into private hands after the war, even though the RFC owned 75% of the aviation industry at the end of World War II. It was their intention to um, have reconversion, to convert the economy back into private hands and to sell all of that to those uh, to private industry, which it successfully did. And those industries have thrived. Our middle class thrived after World War II because of these massive investments. So yes, the, the Pennsylvania Turnpike is great. And so are all the other bridges, tunnels, and highways that the RFC built during the Great Depression and also during World War II, which advanced mobilization. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. And Roberta in our chat uh, makes comment about uh, desalinization projects on the East and the West Coast. Uh, especially here on the West Coast, uh, uh, we face a crisis with regard to water supply that is only increasing uh, uh, as a consequence of our aquifers uh, being consumed more and more uh, for uh, supplies to our urban areas and also our farmers. Uh, and speaking of uh, water, one last topic before we wrap things up, dams and, and aluminum plants that were developed uh, uh, as a result of the ability of, a, uh, of financing through a national infrastructure bank in the 30s. Uh, what kind of impact, uh, Stephen, uh, did those have on the West particularly uh, as far as the country is concerned? 
The investments the RFC made during World War II particularly helped integrate the West and the South into the national economy. They were still lagging behind the rest of the nation. And the mandate for the RFC was to spread out its investments throughout the nation, primarily for security purposes. They didn't want to have any one industry in one spot then it could be you know destroyed so they spread out these investments throughout the uh, nation aluminum plants dams they were just vital to helping the west develop the the aqueduct i talked about uh, that was built during the great depression was 244 miles long that brought water into the west that that it vitally needed in order for it to grow and to thrive so there are many ways a new national infrastructure bank can do these very same things that were done in the 1930s and the 1940s that improved our nation. We can do it again today. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, next, uh, there's a question uh, uh, that I'm very pleased has come um, uh, out of uh, a staff person's uh, 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 offices uh, of Congresswoman uh, Rashida Talib's uh, uh, offices in uh, uh, Dearborn, Michigan, Mustafa. Uh, asks, uh, would the bank lend exclusively to local and state governments? You mentioned a certain percentage of infrastructure. Infrastructure is privately held, I believe. Uh, so, uh, Alfeca, uh, could you answer that question for the moment? We, we envisage that, the, uh, that this is a public bank for public infrastructure as the engine for uh, economic growth in the United States. That's what we envisage. Uh, they're, they're under, uh, so we envisage that uh, the owners of the public infrastructure would be the ones taking the loans and we could uh, create new entities. For example, uh, in, a, in an inner city area, if we wanted to build affordable housing, we could create a new uh, housing authority, for example, that would be owned uh, but off books from the state or local governments. Um, but that's not to go, that's not to say that we can't do uh, other kinds of projects uh, under the umbrella of the bank, which has provisions for uh, doing anything that's within the common good. Uh, in Rust Belt areas, we envisage why, uh, for example, why should a plant, an auto plant, for example, close down and workers go out of work and uh, um, then, uh, and no private industry is moving in to take its place. Uh, whereas we have certain needs all over the country, uh, why can't uh, the, the bank uh, do like the RFC did and uh, buy up uh, industrial manufacturing sites and convert them to um, say uh, train, uh, rail train production or a wind turbine, uh, a new wind turbine production uh, for uh, renewable energy or any other processes like that, and then eventually sell those uh, plants back to, uh, to private hands. Thank you, Elfeka. May, uh, may I add something to that? Please do. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation evolved, and I think that this, this new bank will also evolve as needs become apparent, as, as things happen. Uh, the RFC would establish a new corporation when a need arose that they hadn't uh, thought about. For instance, they created the Disaster Loan Corporation to help people whose homes had been destroyed by floods. Uh, they you know, fielded attorneys and accountants in these areas and helped people restore their houses. They would make loans to cities. They even helped a whole city move from one spot to another after it had been completely destroyed by the Mississippi River floods of 1937, I believe. So in answer to the question, I would, would think that this bank is going to evolve to address the needs of the people it serves, the American people, just like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did so beautifully in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, Stephen, let me follow up uh, with a question uh, that has been asked uh, and referenced in the chat uh, twice now. Uh, Desolidization, as far as water supplies are concerned, how the bank could it uh, tackle and approach that particular problem. And second of all, above and beyond that, uh, a question has been uh, asked with regard to uh, our industrial uh, 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 erosion over the past 30 or 40 years. 
uh, where we used to have steel plants in Pittsburgh and in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, and now uh, most of that is being produced in uh, China or India and only uh, uh, specialization, uh, specialized steel as I understand it is, is one of the few remaining uh, industrial operations we have is, uh, in that regard. So uh, uh, your sense of how our industrial sector would be potentially revitalized as a result of an infrastructure bank? An infrastructure bank will revitalize our industries by addressing our needs today. And a lot of that comes from green energy. That's something that the, the infrastructure bank would be so perfect at doing and implementing. Just like I talked about the EHFA, helping people retrofit their homes so they're energy efficient and storm resistant. That will make the green energy industry blossom. And that's what we need. We need to reduce fossil fuel consumption and emissions from power plants. We can come, become the leading green energy capital of the world through the National Infrastructure Bank when it helps people retrofit their homes and their business buildings so that they're more energy efficient and storm resistant. Um, as far as desalinization, I would have to turn that one over to Alfeca because what I can say is I can tell you how the RFC would have handled something like that. It would have been, it would have, if the board thought it was viable, it would have made loans to build those plants. That's, that's what it would have done. But first and foremost, they were not going to make loans if they did not think that they were, uh, could be repaid and that the project was viable. They were not going to throw taxpayers dollars away on bad projects. I'm not saying that about desalinization but it would be for the board or the, the leaders of the infrastructure bank to determine, is this a viable project? Are they coming to us with a good project? That, that, and can we restructure it if it's not so that it is and we can support it? But it's all done through lending, not spending. Uh, Alfeka, your turn. Right, uh, so what I would say is that um, there are two things. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, it's true that climate change is the existential threat of our time, and we really must uh, reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, there's still a lot of science that needs to go on to show what is the best way to do that. For example, is it all going to be uh, wind turbines and solar panels to replace, or uh, is there a, a place in there for nuclear energy? Uh, we want to make sure that we have the best state-of-the-art technologies, the most efficient systems when we roll over into uh, these new systems that we're going to build. Uh, and so that'll take every, all hands on deck. That's why the, the bank will be a great clearinghouse and, as I said, uh, sort of plowing the road for uh, bringing up the discussion in a holistic place of what is the best way to move forward. For example, you could build a thorium uh, a nuclear power plant that desalinates the water at the same time that it's producing uh, sustainable energy with no, with no energy transmissions. That's the latest uh, technology on board. So there, there's still a lot of work to do on all these areas to, to determine what is the best technologies, but the bank will take a prominent role in, um, in helping to, to develop them. Uh, Alfeca, here's a, a sort of uh, overall uh, uh, perspective of the whole concept of a national infrastructure bank. If it's such a great idea, uh, you know, why does there appear to be resistance to it? Yes. So uh, you'll, you'll, of course, you'll know that great quote by uh, Albert Einstein that it's sort of the height of insanity to keep on trying over and over again, the, the same uh, techniques and then expecting a different result. We've tried to pay for infrastructure through the budget since the Reconstruction Finance Corporation ended in 1957, and we have not been successful in doing so. We've had four great banks in our history's past. Now, there, there's, there are a, a, a bit ago, uh, most people weren't born when these banks were around, so uh, we have to 
be historians and go back and look at our past uh, and learn from them as the best examples of the way to go forward here. Um, so uh, really, this is just a, a case of uh, teaching and uh, educating people and uh, bringing this uh, um, example of how we have a viable plan in HR 6422 to create a fifth bank that will be really the only way forward. It's, it's the only plan now on the books to uh, pay for all of the infrastructure, rehire all the people that are now unemployed, and move to the 21st century uh, technologies and, uh, uh, and re refurbish our economy. So uh, it's really an educating, uh, and so I'm very glad for all the people that are on the, uh, the webinar today. This webinar will be posted on nibcoalition.com. So if you're interested and you would like to spread the word yourself in your own communities, uh, please do look for the copy you know, and send a, a, a link uh, to all of your friends uh, and ask them to call up their congressmen and support HR 6422 uh, for National Infrastructure Bank. Great, thank you, Alfeca. Uh, Stephen, uh, uh, with regard to uh, 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 the argument that uh, said that uh, uh, that some have made that the policies of uh, the bank were not all that successful uh, during the 1920s, 30s rather, and that uh, they were ineffective or failures. Uh, any response uh, to those arguments uh, uh, as to uh, the legitimacy and the validity of a naf national infrastructure bank? Uh, I mean, I, I would take exception to, the, to, to anybody who would think that the RFC failed. It was the most successful New Deal agency of all, all of them. It essentially saved capitalism and democracy. And I would, you know, say to the person who asked that question, look at the millions and millions of people whose lives were impacted in positive ways through the activities of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, whether it was helping them to refinance their homes, whether it was helping them plug into the electric age, uh, whether it was to help them get from one part of the country to the other on a high speed train, whether it was that they got to keep a job or got a job that was paying good wages. The RFC did all of these things. It helped every citizen in the United States of America, every business, and it made money for the federal government while doing so. And I want to go back to the point that, that we were talking about. You had asked, you know, what is the resistance to this bank? And I keep saying, it is our attitude towards government. Once upon a time, we embraced our government. We loved our government. It was the patriotic thing to do was to support our government. And I think that's what we need today. We need to stop thinking of our government as our enemy, or as one president said, I think something like, you know, the most dangerous words in the vocabulary are, I'm with the government and I'm here to help you. We need to turn that completely around. The government is a good thing. And the National Infrastructure Bank could be just the epitome of good government, just like the RFC was. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, ladies and gentlemen, everyone who, ha who has joined us today, I want to thank you so much for um, viewing our presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure and an honor to have you um, uh, here and uh, uh, describe to you what uh, I uh, and our panelists and those of us that are um, a part of the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank uh, are promoting. Uh, we think it is a unique point in time with regard to history, uh, the history of our country and the economic challenges that it faces with the unemployment uh, uh, numbers being as high as they are and the infrastructure uh, uh, failures or uh, a lack of development uh, that uh, is increasingly creating a crisis as far as the efficiency of our government is concerned. Um, we have already presented uh, 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 a, a, a number of uh, webinars already and we will be presenting more and I'll prompt you with those in just a moment. Uh, but first I want to ask those of you that believe as we do that this is a, 
an idea that must be adopted by our country and promoted, that you contact your member of Congress and advocate to them that they support the bill that has been sponsored in Congress, H.R. 6422, uh, and urge them to uh, review it uh, and support it and vote for it. Uh, and you may contact your member of Congress by using this phone number, 202-224-3121. Next, uh, I want to um, advise you that our next webinar presentation will occur next Thursday, September 24th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And it is uh, titled, A Platform for Victory, the National Infrastructure Bank and the Presidential Election. Uh, the panelists that we will have included uh, for that presentation will include elected officials, um, uh, labor leaders, uh, 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 community opinion leaders, uh, describing uh, 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 what kind of impact a national infrastructure bank will have on their communities uh, specifically. Uh, it's where the tire, so to speak, meets the road. And uh, lastly, uh, I urge you uh, that uh, uh, if you wish to obtain additional information with regard to the bank, uh, the you visit our website at www.nibcoalition.com and you will find additional information there, including uh, the videos of our previous webinars uh, uh, and also this one, uh, which will be posted shortly. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Stephen, so much for your wonderful presentation. As always, uh, your authoritative analysis of uh, uh, FDR's uh, uh, infrastructure bank and development then uh, is so relevant to us today. It's uh, important that we understand how it functioned then uh, in order for us to apply it now. And Alfeca, uh, your expertise with regard to economics and how this uh, bank actually functions uh, uh, as far as uh, HR 6422 is concerned uh, uh, reveals what we can do uh, and reflects what we can do today in order to, to make this happen and, and turn our country around and re-employ uh, the 30 million people that we have out of work now in, in, on tasks that our country, uh, nas country's national and economic security uh, uh, needs uh, to progress into the future in the 21st century. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to you attending our next webinars. Take care.